Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. Good afternoon, I think. No, it's still the morning. It's 11 o'clock. My topic is about privilege and economy. Exclusive powers, both disregard learners' potential in learning mathematics in South Africa. And I want you to take note of my topic because it's looking at two things that I think are the challenge. They challenge our systems, they challenge our classrooms, they challenge the society globally, privilege and economy. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to talk about the background that we all know, that South Africa esteem when it comes to mathematics teaching and learning is very low. We all know that we are the lowest performers in the world. We all know that we also perform below even those countries that are poorer than us. That is where we are, that is our status. That is why I feel ourselves our self-esteem as a country is very low when it comes to mathematics. We don't feel proud of ourselves. But I also believe that we really need to start being people with mirrors. In the mirror, whom do you see? Yes. So meaning let's stop pointing fingers and start seeing ourselves and start reflecting on what is it that we are not doing right. This year, I was part of the team's group. I am usually part of them, but I left them, but I'm still going back. When they were working into looking at the, into the data and doing some secondary analysis, the difference that that data shows that we have made improvement, if you can look at it, yes, for those who want to feel good about it, it feels good, it means something, but for me it means nothing. Because when you look at it and we look, you will look at the amount of money that we say we are using in South Africa to improve education, we are not making any difference. And that should be our concern. There are studies, evaluation studies, that are supporting what I'm saying. That a lot of money is put into the system. There, is, there are bursaries, Funza Lushaka bursaries. We all know them. Have they made a difference? No. There is Dinaleti project. We all know it. A lot of investment in schools, buying manipulatives, buying things to make sure maths and science is improving. Have we made a difference? No. So the mon monetary value is not there. The question I have is what influenced this poor performance? There's a lot of research that is done in South Africa, especially led uh, by Stellenbosch University, that shows the inequities in the country. It's so sad after 1994 that the gap between the poor and the rich in South Africa widened instead of getting narrow. And it's even said after 20 years of democracy that it worsened. The inequities are there. And let me be honest and be blunt, South Africans are self-servers. South Africans are about me, 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 me. The teacher in the classroom thinks about herself, not the kid. The principal is thinking about himself, so I will enroll as many because my salary will go up. That is South Africa for you. The district manager is protecting his job and go and run a workshop about something he doesn't even understand. That is South Africa for you. 
I can go on up to my president. It's about me, 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 me. So, I am saying, look at the mirror when we look at the issues of education in this country. I like uh, my colleague, Graven at Rhodes, when she says, as much as we have these problems, let's look at our problems differently and look at having a discourse about opportunities. And I think I'm coming from that angle. Let's really understand our learners. Let's see what is there. Let's forget about me, 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 me. Look, I'll be 50 this year. There is no going back. I'm old. But when I'm, will these kids be proud that I was here? That should be the question I'm asking myself. Or will, be, will they say good riddance when I die? Because I am leaving no legacy behind. Are uh, the kids you are teaching in your classroom going to say anything good about you? Or are they saying he's never there? I don't even know how he looks like, but I go to school every day. Therefore, the purpose of this presentation for me today is to highlight learner abilities and thinking processes in their mathematical development with the aim to identify how does this socioeconomic status variable play in our context, especially here at home. And how I do that, I'm doing an exploration but I'm bringing forth preschool numeracy because one thing I know and research has proved that numeral abilities are innate, that means are internal. We do not give birth to dumb children. We give birth to the most brilliant, elastic, curious, amazing gifts. But when they arrive, they see dumb people who want to tell them, don't think like this. Don't be curious. Shut up. And it's true what I'm saying, because every time I start the year, I like playing with young children. But I need to make sure I play with them before they enter a classroom. Because when they enter a classroom, they are told to shut up and listen. Then there is no chance you can play with those kids because they, don't, they can't even move. You need to see them before they go to that system that shish them. Then you can learn so much from them. But why are we doing that? I also use upper grades in this paper as benchmarks in making more sense of the schooling system and its influence on the mathematical growth of South African learners from poor backgrounds. It's so sad that globally, we say poverty is a predictor of poor quality mathematics experiences. If you are poor, I will make sure the teacher who teaches you is unqualified. If you are poor, I will make sure you are one of the 75 children in one classroom. One classroom. And if you are poor, I will make sure you go to a school with no resources. Yeah. And if you are poor, I will make sure I don't teach you. I will say my class is overcrowded. I will say there are no enough chairs. I will say there's nothing. So I won't make a difference so that you get out of this poorness.
So yes, mathematics teachers are scarce, but how can we cr increase the numbers if we cannot improve the performance of these children? Where are we going to get these mathematics teachers? Are they going to fall on trees or from the sky? We have to make sure we give quality mathematics education to the children so that they will become these mathematics teachers we do not have. But we don't have a plan like that. We enjoy saying they are scarce, they are scarce, they are scarce because we are not prepared to make any change by producing good quality graduates who have done mathematics at school, who also are interested in teaching. One of my teachers told me one day that, you know, you know since we did a career day, and all our children want to be police or police guards or soldiers. Then I said, why? They don't want to be teachers? She said, no. Then I said, why? She said, you know, maybe it's because we come to schools with jeans these days. That, that reminded me of a kid. I was, uh, one of my teachers used to wear heels. That's why I'm wearing heels for you. I want to impress. Um, and she was like, the way she was handling herself, you were looking forward towards that. I wanted to wear those heels. I wanted to speak English like her. I wanted to move like her. Maybe as teachers today, they look at us, they're like, ah, it's a disaster. The police are looking good. They've got uniform, they are neat. They, because that is what is going on. Go in your classrooms and ask your kids what do they want to become. They won't say a teacher. But again, there is more. I won't go there because I will hurt you. There is more they see they don't want to be part of. Remember, the teachers were the most respectable members of the society. You know, if you can give me a chance, I will show you how my grade one teacher was working, my grade two, all of them, I still remember them like it was yesterday. I told you I'll be 50 this year. But I can even imitate how they spoke, even today. They made a mark in my life. But are we making marks in our children's lives today? This scarcity of mathematics teachers if you look and notice, I, I talked, I said, mark privilege. It only happens only if you are poor. Uh, I grew up during the time there was Transkai, Siskai, do you know those things? Yeah. And the Republic. So I was part of the Transkai. Uh, my president, during the time I was Babu uh, Matanzima, Ah, Gagom Ah, Dalwong. And one thing he did well, I don't care what you say today in your politics, was to make sure we had the best math teachers. Some were coming from Uganda. Some were coming from Ghana. Some were coming from India. My science teacher was Mr. Rajaratnam from India. He made sure that we got the best quality education. But today, we are xenophobic. <laughs> and then, where do you think we are going to be if we are not willing to accept our faults and move forward? and improve, and remember the damage we did after 1996. How many math teachers took packages? How many mathematics teachers left the education system? The best teachers we had were no longer comfortable in the system because we were confused and passionate and changing curriculum like crazy. And people were like, we are getting confused, we would rather take package and leave. Those are our, um, our mistakes, and we need to accept them. We were so emotional. We used to have that language that bury this, bury Bandu education. But what we never did was to investigate that Bandu education. I didn't. I was not one of the pupils who got education from Bandu education. I didn't get it. I don't even know how it tastes, because I was in Transkai. 
and we had what we called Cape education. And really it was quality education. And I know even in the Republic, like it is today, there were people who were refusing to give us Bandu education, who were doing a good job. But we even stand a chance today to make sure in the classroom we give what is right. Let us stop saying the government wants them to pass at 30%. In your classroom, they must pass at 50% in your classroom. I'm and take ownership of your country and your role. Stop saying they want us to do this. Do the right thing where you are. As the, in the past, they did the right thing with us. Let's stop for pointing figures. Look at you, what are you doing that is right? That's what is going to make these children think about you when you're dead. 30%, we keep on saying this 30% thing. An embarrassing thing to say in public anyway. 50% in your classroom. 50% in your school. Let the government do whatever. They are politicians, they are not educators. And then we, 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 we lie publicly and say education eradicates poverty. Are we telling the truth? I have an MBA graduate in my, in, my, in my house with straight A's, international MBA. She cannot get a job in South Africa for the past two years. So does poverty eradicate, uh, education eradicate poverty? Not in South Africa, maybe in other countries. Because you become a clever black in South Africa. So you can't look forward to get something when you are a clever black. There's nothing for you. So let us be honest about what we are doing. Each and every one of us is responsible. We are all responsible for the poor performance of mathematics in South Africa, especially in this room. All of us, it's down because of us. Not because of somebody next door. Not because of Zuma, he knows nothing about maths. So let's take ownership of our flaws so that we can improve. Because if you blame her, when are you going to improve? Blame yourself. What is it that you are doing? Why are you not teaching your own child in your classroom? That is the first question you must ask yourself. Why are you sending your child to somebody else? Is it because you know you're not doing the job? <laughs> now I will talk about white privilege. Remember I said privilege. Okay, I'm a diversity scholar and a renowned one. I was awarded by Michigan University. I look at diversity issues very seriously. We need to face reality. We have psychological issues that we need to face head on. When I talk about privilege, you know when you own something, immediately you are entitled to protect it because you own it. But when you don't own anything, I'm talking about property ownership so that you can understand when I talk about privilege. When you own something, you can protect it with everything you have. But when you don't own, you do what we were doing the first night we had a bat. I won't go back to it, but we did that to show that we don't own anything and therefore let's mess up everything. You know when you don't own, you mess up everything. Ownership is a very important thing that empowers you as a person and entitles you and some people use it to exclude others. I own a car, so you can't be a pedestrian. I will hit you that South African way. Even if the traffic lights are green for the person to cross, 
the motorists in South Africa do, do this. You do not own. I own. I'm trying to show you what does privilege come from. It comes from ownership. Unfortunately, Africans were owning decades ago. I can't even know. I know there is that history that Africa was one of the richest continents in the world. That was then. But for a long time, they were colonized. They were ripped off. They didn't own anything. As a result now, they can even steal a pen. <laughs> you just put your, den, uh, your pencil here, and you talk to the next person, it's gone. <laughs> and you get so embarrassed to ask, where did it go? Because you know it has in their feet. But it is because you do, they don't own anything. And therefore, they are trying to own even if it is nothing. And that causes those who own to have privilege and entitlement and demands. And they feel it is right to exclude others because they own. And it's one thing that we need to face in South Africa so that we can be able to move on. As long as they don't own, they will continue stealing because they have nothing. And therefore, they are not even entitled to anything. But once you have ownership, you are entitled and you protect what you owe. It goes a long way. It enters the classroom. When I enter a classroom as a young black South African, coming to school with my bare, beautiful feet and a shiny face, but with a smile, what I enter the classroom with is lack of ownership. When I enter, my teacher looks at me and says, oh, the poor kid, come on. Oh, she doesn't have anything. Did you have breakfast? No, ma'am. What I own in my mind, the intellectual property I have, cannot be seen because I'm a poor black kid. And therefore, the teacher says, shut up, you own nothing. I will tell you, fill you up with something. So what you bring doesn't matter. You're coming from nothing. And this is what I mean when I talk about privilege. However, if you have something and you enter a classroom, people want to listen to you. What you have to say, what are you saying? Come again? Because you own something and you are intellectual by default. <laughs> and, and that gives you power and you will conquer this mathematics. It was done in the past, only nobles noble men and the monks were doing mathematics in the past. Mathematics has a long history of exclusion. And then when we started trying in Africa, which those Africans who don't want to be called Africans in Egypt, those who were noticed first, they are not Africans. They, they do, dare not say an Egyptian is an African. You'll be in trouble. They call themselves what? Uh, Muslims mostly. They would rather be that, but Africans is not what they like. However, when it was noticed, the mathematics they were practicing, it was called applied mathematics. The, the, the information was taken to Greece to be polished and become mathematics, pure mathematics. Do, do, do you see ownership and entitlement to own your information, but I will polish it a little bit. Like our gold that leaves our land in a raw situation and go and be polished somewhere and it comes back and I have to pay quite a lot of money, but it was coming from Africa. Because I lack polishing skills or I do not see power in what I have and I don't see that I have. We also need to get out of not having and have, and when you have, you protect what you have. You fight for what you have. 
Yeah, I like when you say, mm, but what are we doing about our education that we have? <laughs> this literature is used broadly in the United States about learning about entitlement because it does speak to education, about the power, about the power of having and what it does to you and what it makes you to become. Other people are even autonomy, but we are scared of becoming autonomy, autonomous. We want to be a group all the time. We do things in groups, even if they are stupid, we will do them in groups. <laughs> and we do not want to identify ourselves as individual and take a stand yeah. because we want to be loved or liked because we lack love, which is interesting. Because I grew up in a home where there was too much love. There's no reason for us to lack. But we need to reflect. Look at the mirror. Yeah. What do you see? Is it good? What are you doing about it? So therefore, we need to get out of this. And critical race theory does help us. Because in South Africa, we point fingers and call other people racist. But we are racist, all of us. Because you know what? We had a dilemma on Monday, I'll go back to it. But if one of my white colleagues addressed it, you are going to be saying they were racist. Am I lying? Our dilemma, which I won't say, other people didn't see it. Those who were with me that Monday night of the party. That dilemma, if a white colleague came and stood up here and addressed it, was she or he not going to be racist? Yes. That was the first place to run to. You are racist. We are supposed to binge food like that. That's unhealthy, actually, what we were doing live on Monday. It's killing us. Because food, we are supposed to eat food moderately and for health reasons, just to feed the body health-wise, not to kill the body. Monday, we were killing ourselves. But... But I am taking us back to this racist card South Africa is about instead of building itself. We call each other racist when we want to hide from our faults. If I don't want to fix things, you are racist. And shame our colleagues run. Who wants to be racist? But I'm racist immediately I say that. I'm the racist one. Because we need to be frank with each other. We need to be honest with each other. If you are doing something wrong, I mustn't be scared to say it because you are going to call me xenophobic or racist or what. Wrong is wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't ma matter how you look like. I'm short like a dwarf, ne? but that doesn't mean that I must do as I like because I'm short you tall. I need to account and be responsible as a dwarf I am. You understand? Yeah. So if then you get angry and say, look at this dwarf. Sometimes it's not because you are discriminating me, but you are so angry because I'm not listening and I'm using my dwarfness <laughs> not to move forward. <laughs> so let's grow as South Africans, especially in mathematics education, because we are a disaster and an embarrassment. Since 1999, we've been performing poorly. This is 2017. Instead, we are adding more teams. We are entering into this competition. And there's something about us. Sometimes we are hallucinating. You keep on going to a competition, you know you lose all the time. There is research that is coming out now. It says parents' education is a possible predictor to address poor mathematics in South Africa, especially in this country. That analysis, I was part of it. And it was, for me, it was shocking to see that if the parent of a black child, especially the black poor child, has managed to get a, a, a tertiary education Certificate, the child perform better. You, while the teachers are not going to school, then that is not a solution for us. 
It's a good thing to know, but it's just a useless thing to know. Because no one wants to educate these kids so that they will be better parents. Because it could be another solution for us if we were willing to educate. But we are not willing to educate and therefore it's another disaster. But it's a predictor that is coming out that the education of a parent now is playing a role to the performance. So I wonder, what are you thinking about that as you are a teacher because you are educating the parent of tomorrow? I did a desktop review. I used quite a lot of my research on early maths education because I've done quite a lot ever since uh, I came back from home. And I used then these international studies because I really tried to understand this socioeconomic barrier and this exclusion. I used the TIMS 2015, the numeracy for grade five. I also used the work of uh, my colleagues for grade three, and I also used grade six, the SACMEC studies, and I also used the grade nine team, and I used one of my students' work at master's level where we were looking in detail now in what is really going on. And I want to share that with you because it might it might help us a lot. These are the young ones. I love children. I focus too much on them more than teachers. Not that I don't love you. I love you a lot. You made me who I am. But I love children because they tell me who they are more than what we think they are. Now, if we look at these findings, we did an interview before these children started any lesson at school at grade R. These are the kids from preschool, from home. But look what they came with. Out of 26 learners, 12 count meaningfully in English up to 55. By meaningful counting, I mean they could do verbal. Do you understand verbal counting, rote counting? Yes. They could do object counting, which is one to, cor one to correspondence. They were able to respond to the question, how many, which we call cardinality. They were able to write numerals in correct order from 1 to 20. They haven't started school. They were able to write numerals in correct order and in easy course, because these are the course kids we worked with, only count to issue. And I want you to have language policy at the back of your mind and think about who is the policy maker. I'm sure it's not easy who lived 50 years ago. Do, do you hear what, what is going on in these findings? They are meaningfully counting up to 55 in English. And the policy maker no CC wants them to do that in course. And if we look at the other learners, eight, that was 12 of the 26. The eight learners were able to do the verbal, the same 200, object counting to 49, able to respond to how many questions to 29, able to write numerals in correct order to 10, in easy course, only count to 10 to issue. And the interesting thing, one learner was doing, one in a two zimbini, meaning two, meaning the English counting is my native language. So this in a is a second language. So one in a two zimbini, three zindatu, four zintanu, five zindandatu, up to ten. This was interesting, actually. I was shocked because remember, we are policymakers. Then the three learners show the following verbal road counting to 50, object counting 1 to 1 to 20, able to respond to how many to 20, road numerals from 1 to 10 in easy course I went up to 10. This is English numeracy that it has developed before they enter school, formal schooling. And the last three learners were diverse and but could count in English to 10 but you could see they are the weakest. <laughs> Think about what does this mean? Let's move on. Let's look at 
what studies are saying about great performance. I looked at uh, and summarized what Paul and Kotze found in 2014. They were saying that only 16% of grade three. I just want you to go with me. When they entered school, they were higher than what is said now. 16% of grade three learners are performing at, at their appropriate level in South Africa. Only 16%. I wonder what happened to, to others. Please let us reflect. Ne? I'm sure a mirror is in front of you. You know exactly what we haven't done. Grade five numeracy based on teams. Uh, you can see, if you look at no fee schools, it's showing nicely. Ne? At no fee, fee schools, we had 75% learners who were showing that they could be pulled to a higher performance. They had potential. We do understand potential. That's Vygotsky's language, ne? Vygotsky believes that we all have potential, but we just need somebody to push us up. So they were indicated, indicating that they could go higher. And then if you look at low, have some basic mathematics knowledge. Fee paying school, 445 kids. And then if you look at the intermediate, those that can apply basic mathematics knowledge for, uh, in straightforward situations, so not in complex, and 506, which is 60%, and then high can apply their knowledge and understanding to solve problems, and that's 11%. It's, it's decreasing now. Advanced, only 14%, and they are from independent school. This is a set story, and something we like in Africa. Ne? In Africa, the best schools are private schools. I'm talking about the continent. Where we pay our tax money, there are the worst schools. Do you know that the tax money is your money? It's not government money. Oh, you do? OK. So where we pay our tax money? Is a disaster. But for our kids to get some mercy, we have to take them to private school. Now look at this. I've seen poor parents, people who clean people's homes, who take kids to private school. In South Africa, poor parents, they know the value of education. They work so hard deprive themselves of everything to make sure they take their children to the best schools. Don't you feel guilty? When you see those taxes that are going to these rich schools, full of children from poor homes, because you can't service them. Let's look at SACMET at a glance. SACMET is a, is a regional studies. Like there are quite a number of African countries that I won't talk about that are involved. But I'm all focusing on grade six now, performance levels adapted from SPOL. But why did I jump? What about the team's numeracy? I did. OK. The SACMEC. As you see, from their performance levels, dropouts, or never attended school, it's 2%. That is a good thing, ne? OK. <laughs> Enumerate by grade 6. They don't know any maths by grade 6. That is level 0. 39%. I wonder what is this story? 50% with basic numeracy skills, with higher order skills, only 9%. Grade nine, no fee schools, you can see them. And you can see independent schools. It's so clear. Now I want just to share one problem with you. It's a grade 11 problem that was given to grade 11 learners from Folashade's study. This is the problem. The sum of two consecutive odd numbers is 52. What are the two odd numbers? Let's see what the learners did. What is happening now with my slides? 
What's next? Okay. I'm sharing only three learners. Look at learner Z. Learner Z had an idea that the sum of two odd consecutive, so those are two different numbers, is equal to 52, so therefore was able to have that algebraic expression, x plus y is 52. But then learner Z got lost as he is trying because learner Z shows there that he says, let x be 13, meaning he's not or she's not thinking about the word consecutive in the problem. Ne? So maybe that word was too bombastic or doesn't mean anything. Hence, then Lena C couldn't solve the problem. Do you see that? But there is some um, algebraic thinking going on in the mind. But look at this, Lena. Uh, my student even did those red things. So don't mind them. And I, I heard you saying, yo. But, but look at this, Lena. Understand this, Lena. The Lena started by listing the, num the natural numbers and then underlined the odd numbers. What does that mean? The learner understand the question very clear. Underlined the odd numbers and then played around with odd numbers and made a dot next to the one that was giving the solution. The problem has been attended correctly but at a level that the teacher doesn't know and therefore the, learn the teacher says wrong. <laughs> and this happens this, uh -uh. this is worse because then I'm thinking about our matriculants. You know, when I saw this, I cried. Oh, like, oh, poor kids. They are assessed by people who don't even understand the processes of thinking. Yes, think about them. The learner understood the problem, but this learner is operating at an arithmetic level, not at an algebraic level. And therefore, we are, he, she, she is penalized because the last teacher who taught this teacher was in grade six. And this, this child, and this child now is in grade 11. So she's still, or he's still holding on, on the grade six work. Grade seven, nothing happened. Grade eight, grade nine. Grade 10, now the child is in grade 11. Oh, she's doomed. Because at grade 12, no one will look at that as you see the crosses. But I'm trying to expose you to what is happening, the real thing that is happening in our, with our children. The last one was the one the teachers would love. The last one understood the problem, like the second one, but used the algebraic term the terminology the correct way and did all the good steps and got the the answer right, but I am taking you through this because I want you to have the feel I have about ch children. What are we learning now? All I can say is that when you come from a low socioeconomic environment as a child, you become poorer as you go up the stairs of steps of education. Your teachers make you poorer every day. You came with richness, they take it away bit by bit. Bit by bit, by the time you finish school, you, you have nothing left. I showed you, you saw it, ne? it's evident it's there. You enter school rich, you leave school very poor. Intellectually, the theme of this conference is about restoring learners' dignity. And I'm saying, these learners have dignity. They are the most beautiful, gorgeous things that end our classrooms. But I think from day, out, from day one, they enter we take away their dignity. It's time for us to restore it. Let them be children, number one. Let them be intuitive, number two. Let them tell you what they think the problem you gave, you, you gave them is about. Let them engage with you in telling you how they are thinking. Don't know the answer of the question, why were you asking it in the first place? Let them give you the answer. What about the privilege? And I'm talking now about white privilege. Do you ever hear that white children from SES are performing low? It's not a variable for them because they own property. When you own, you become powerful. We need to teach our children to own. Oh, 10 minutes. So it's different. No, no, no. 
Okay. You need to, to own. Let us teach our children to be autonomous, to differentiate between right and wrong. Do it in your classroom, right and wrong. Let's stop this group thing of doing wrong things together. And somebody is singing and we are following. And it's so bad to be a follower sometimes because you don't think. It doesn't matter. You can kill me today for telling the truth. It will make me go to my grave smiling because I was telling you the truth. So now my questions are very hard for South Africa in general because we are all brothers and sisters and we love this country. That is why we are here. My question is, who is this learner who continuously experienced lack of qualified teachers, lack of schooling infrastructure, lack of books, lack going to overcrowded classrooms, and lack of opportunities to learn? And why continuously? Are we not feeling ashamed of ourselves? Can the history of exclusion be taken away from the puzzle while we find solutions? How do we restore learner dignity if entitlement continues to belong to the few white privileged? Let us all own something. We will stop stealing. Let us own something. We will really stop stealing. Am I right? Yes. We will stop taking all the food so that you don't get... <laughs> Let us own something. Let us own something. Because the problem is psychological. It's psychological. It's not healthy. I want us to see this problem. It is not healthy because that food made you so sick the next morning. It's psychological. Let's stop doing it. Now what I'm saying, I'm done. Yes, this is my last slide. It's just that this thing keeps on popping up things. If we can look at these two, two theories, the other one about privilege is called critical race theory. But the other one was analyzing our practices. But all in all, it's saying exclusion Ignored learners thinking processes because that's why we think we are not racist but our children when they enter classroom with no shoes we know they are poor and therefore they cannot talk what are we doing we are discriminating against ourselves and let me tell you if you discriminate me you being like me you are dumb because you don't see I'm you and if you discriminate those young children and enter in your classroom who look like you just because they don't have shoes, you are dumb because you are discriminating against yourself. We need to do what is the best for the children. If you look at student B, I want us to go to that student who has solved the problem, but not according to, your, to, 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 to algebra, but correctly in arithmetic. That means you as a teacher, you have made some blocks in your knowledge. You don't know the thinking processes. You are not curious on your children. You are shocked at the exam because you don't even know them. Then why are you there? But, but we also need to be there too. If you can't focus on a memorandum. A memorandum is designed to give you a guide, but be the teacher. Don't kill the teacher when you're making children. South African kids have proven many times, read the team's findings. They have potential, especially these poor kids. We have seen in matriculation, how many kids in matric, that always surprises us, coming from poor backgrounds, poor homes, poor schools, but they top the country. They have proven many times that they have it in them. Who doesn't have it in them? Is it us? Moving forward, we need to understand the significance of this inclusion in moving forward. And I'm saying we all exclude children. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, colleagues, colleagues, just sit down, please, hold on. Uh,
please, please take your seats. Do not leave, there's an important announcement to make. And I also want to honor the speaker. So, just in closing, in closing, just hang on up there, upstairs, just hang on up there. Um, no, Sisi, you've struck hard at the heart of the matter. Okay. You certainly it's hard. And I want to say to you, you are not a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> you are a giant. Thank you. <laughs> and while you set out to, to, to focus on early learning in mathematics, the heart of your passion, your words have resonated with all those who are sincerely concerned with education in our country. Your comments are exceptionally well-timed. In the light of recent press releases, I'm sure you're all aware, aware of, that we are led to believe have come from the DBE. And your passion, your passion is inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. You've certainly influenced our thinking this morning, most positively. We thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got a few announcements to make. I've got a few announcements to make, but before I do that, I want to say thank you to Mosisi. And I think on behalf of uh, the Amisa LOC and Amisa in general, we want to say congratulations to Mosisi. She is taking up the position of dean at the University of the Free State. No, we don't. Oh. No. She is the dean over there and she started that position. What date was she in? In October. So let us give her a round of applause. All right, a few announcements. Number one is that all buses will be leaving at 1300, just after 1300, behind building 123. There's a parking lot at the back of this building over there. You'll see it over there, the buses will be parked over there. So please make your way through the buses. The lunches will be provided at, lunch packs will be provided at the bus. Okay? Secondly, uh, the buses will be clearly marked whether you're going to Addo, Bay West, or whether you're going to the city door. Secondly then, the breakfast and supper in the tent is only for the people that booked for the hostel accommodation. Honey note that the breakfast and supper in the tent is only for those people who have booked for hostel accommodation. Thirdly, the session by Faith Flo and Osisi Feza tomorrow at 17.05 will move to the morning at 10.05 in room in building 123, room number 0026. Right? I'm repeating this. The 17.05 session tomorrow has been moved to 10.05 in building 123-0026. Then, will Lorraine Burgess or Elaine van der Merwe report to reception after the session? We want to slot you in with another. We believe you must just slot. We want to make amendments and we want to slot you in again on the program. Certificates for your attendance will be available after lunch tomorrow. So please make your way to the, uh, we will tell you where to collect in the morning where we will go to, to go to building 11 because if a thousand of you try to go to reception over here, it will be too crowded. So we're thinking about using building 11 for the certificates. Then, E. Malaka, please also report to reception the Paralog Session 6 at 12.05 is in room, no, in room 235.002 has been cancelled. The Paralog Session at 12.05 today has been cancelled. Then two, another presentation, two presentations on Monday could not take place. Mediation of counting concepts. By, by FESA et al. has moved to Wednesday that's now 12.05 in 123.0026 and that's the building over here to my left. 
that no phase I is presented again till 123006. All right. Uh, tomorrow at 1505, also in 0026, 123026, is cultural games and the relevancy to, in teaching and in teaching number. And that is by Bambiso and Feza will be tomorrow at 1505 in 123026. There was an announcement at the Amisa meeting that you're, you have to fill in a form at reception with your sex numbers. The forms are there now. Please go in there and fill your names. All right. The sex numbers, the form that you fill in so that you can send to say specific key points that you were here at the conference. It's very important. Please fill in those forms. Thank you very much.